500 years after Columbus discovers the New World, Gilcrease Museum takes a look back at the first centuries. I'm Barbara Cohenauer. Welcome to Focus on Art and join us for Enterprise of the Indies. of the Indies is a very popular show at Gilcrease, as you can see, and the person responsible for this show is the curator of archival collection, Sarah Irwin. Sarah, welcome to Focus on Art. Thank you. We certainly appreciate being here today. The gallery's full, and that's just the way you like to see things, right? Right. One of the reasons that we have this exhibition going on is to commemorate uh, the Columbus Quincentennial, and I, a lot of school groups are utilizing the show you know, to help, help understand the events around that age and period of exploration. Well, that's one thing that Gilfrey's just does a great job of, and that is supporting the efforts of educators in northeastern Oklahoma. So we have to commend you for that like we always do. Now, Sarah, everything in this collection, or I'm sorry, everything in the show is from your permanent collection. Yes, it is. So we get to see some things now that might normally be in the vaults? Right. A lot of the material we have on display here uh, is, is uh, work on paper. And that, of course, is more fragile than a lot of the other, you know, bronzes and that type of thing. So we don't have it out often. And also, thematically, it fits so well into this. It's, it's hard to, to fit it in just a lot of the open galleries. So this would be Okay, great. Well, I know this is put together in a very specific order, and you said you'd like to begin with this painting of Columbus. I think that's a great place to start. Let's take a look at this. Okay. This this is a painting after the work of a Flemish publisher named Theodore de Brie. Uh, I, I think this is, is fairly typical of the romantic and the unrealistic view of Columbus discovering a new world. Now, for, first of all, uh, the Americas, the Western Hemisphere, wasn't sitting here waiting for Columbus to come and discover them. There was already you know, millions of people living here. And then secondly, you have this very Europeanized, a view of Columbus bringing Christianity and, and civilization to the natives of the region and the natives in, in turn responding by offering gifts of very European looking nature Thanks. to them. Yes, yes. All right. When was this painting done? We don't know. We don't know. Okay. Well, we don't just, have a specific date okay, on, on just these. Very these were, uh, uh, this and the other uh, house panels in this room uh, were, were done uh, for an English house probably several hundred years after the discovery. I see. Okay. Now, what would we want to look at if we're coming to see this show after we start here and see this very Europeanized okay. Columbus? We, we have a few other prints of, of the, the myth of Columbus discovering the New World. Uh, most of these were probably done for the uh, Columbian Exposition that was held in 1892. So at that point, you have a, a, a very different view of Columbus and, and his activities. You know, he, he's, you know, he's really viewed as, as part of the traditional American history, you know, almost like Washington, one of the founding fathers. Mm -hmm. he's, okay. And once again, a very romantic, almost Cecil B. DeMille's kind of depiction. Yeah, I, I love these, these lovely Indian women here. Mm -hmm. You know, in full, full headdresses, like Plains Indians, you know, centuries later. Just, just not accurate at all, but again, fitting into the myth of what they wanted it to be. All right. Mm -hmm. And more prints next to that from the same period? Right. Now, these three were from the same period, but they were French, as opposed to just the American one we just saw. And again, here you see a little, you know, some softer tones and really a little finer. These are hand-done chromolithographs. Um, again, very, very nice, but very much of the myth. Okay, now, if we wanted to leave this kind of myth 
approach to what was happening in 1492 or close to that time, we can really turn to some actual documents that give us a much better representation of that. Okay, Sarah, let's take a look at some of those documents. Now the documents here, this is kind of a tight space, but the documents are some of the, the most unique things in, in our collection. This first item is a, a letter that was written in 1512. It was written by Diego Columbus, the son of Christopher Columbus. Wow. Uh, Diego was uh, the, the viceroy and governor of the Indies at this time. Uh, he proved actually to be much more uh, of an administrator than his father did. Okay. But this, this letter gives some details. Uh, on the, the life in Hispaniola, which is now Haiti in the Dominican Republic, and then talks about uh, the concerns they have for the native inhabitants of the islands. The second document is also written by Diego Columbus. Now this is a, probably a very noteworthy letter in that is, he's writing to the Emperor Charles V, but in it he talks again about uh, his concern for the, the native population and working with uh, others to, to make their lives a little better. And he also then requests the, the, uh, the permission to import African slaves to do some of the work that the Indians had been doing up to this point for the Spanish. You know, it's really amazing. We're talking about the discovery of the Western Hemisphere by the Western Europeans in 1492. The date on this letter is 1519. I mean, we're not even really talking much more than a quarter of a decade here. We're already into the slave business on this, on this uh, mm -hmm. continent. Amazing how quickly that developed. Okay, what's this next document? Okay. The, this, this is a, a large volume. It, it is, again, a manuscript item. It's, only, it's over a thousand pages long, and it's, it's a history of various Spanish activities. The part we have it open to, however, deals, again, with Columbus. Uh, the Bernaldes, who was doing the writing, was a personal friend of the explorer Columbus, and uh, for a, a brief time after his second voyage to the Western Hemisphere, Columbus lived with Bernaldes. And so we have a, a great uh, amount of detail on Columbus's second voyage, and then it goes on to b briefly mention the third voyage, and then announce Columbus's death in 1506. Okay, now this is handwritten, uh -huh. but you have a number of books that are in this collection that are actually printed. Now here's some examples of those, and the first one says it's by Americus Vespucius. There's something familiar about that name. It, there should be. Uh, Vespucius was the one for whom America was named. And it was books such as this, this one was pr printed in 1505, that earned him that recognition. Because I'd say if he, he was only an average explorer. He probably only made two trips to, to the Western Hemisphere. But what he was good at was PR. He could write great letters. And that gained him a lot of attention uh, and a lot with the cartographers of the day and, and the, the public that was reading books at this time. So we, here we have what really earned him the right to have a, a, a whole continent named after him. Wow, what a deal. Mm -hmm. This is a wonderful book now. Is this just uh, a collection of his letters? Uh, right, that's what this is. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then it looks like we have a map right next. Um, to his book, this looks like maybe a, an atlas. Right. This this is based on the work of Ptolemy, who was a second century uh, geographer, but his work was, was kind of rediscovered during the Renaissance. And so here we see how it's been been updated and the new information has been put on it. And of right course, over here on the side. Right. You see another land that was that was unknown heretofore to the Europeans. This you know went on to become known as the coast of Brazil. And then you have uh -huh. uh, up here the islands. Right, some of the, the little islands. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we have one more book in this case. What's this one, Sarah? Okay, this was by uh, a man named uh, Martin Walsemuller, who was a German cartographer. And Walsemuller was the, the first one to apply the name America to a continent. And it was, it was his, in his application, it was only to South America. But it, uh, eventually, it was, of course, applied to, to all of the Western Hemisphere. So by 1509, right. we have the name America uh -huh. being coined. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, now if we leave this kind of tight corner and go out here to sort of the main part of this gallery, we have a number of other publications to look at. And as I recall, you wanted to start with this case. Barbara, what we're looking at now are some of the other early important volumes having to do with that initial period of discovery. Uh, the first one right here is uh, the letter that Columbus wrote, and here by 1494 is already in publication. Uh, the little woodcut that we're seeing is, is really a type of a map. You can see the, the islands uh, named Isabella and Ferdinand and Concepcion, and then supposedly one of the types of Columbus's boat although we know now this, this isn't true at all, uh, than even the middle, medieval-ish castle. Well, that would be a surprise if he had found a medieval castle here. This right. is more of a what they would have liked to have found, perhaps, right. than what they actually did find. Right. And one thing I just think when we're looking at this, that it's really amazing, he got back to Europe in 93, and in one year we have a book published about his travels. Now, we would expect that kind of turnaround today. But you don't think about that when you're thinking about the 15th century. Not at all. But still, they were all very anxious to, to get the word out, to, to publish their findings, and then to promote other travels. The, also, you have other books that, that were uh, soon published you know, in this period of discovery. Now, this one is a little bit later. This is dated 1612, and it's called A History of the West Indies by a man named Peter Martyr. Mm -hmm. Now, Martyr uh, was really uh, considered by many the first historian of the Americas, but he was really kind of a, an armchair historian. He never traveled to the Western Hemisphere. So uh, he just interviewed people who had been here? Right, including Columbus but who he uh, kind of relegated to a minor position. Again, not good PR for, for Columbus. But we think that Martyr was maybe the one that first coined the phrase, the New World. Okay, and I can even read this one. This is the first thing I think we've looked at that's been in English. Right, now it was originally in Spanish and then translated. Okay, mm -hmm. what do we have around the corner here? Now, this is an, another history, but it's a very different history. This is a natural history, and it was by a man named Oviedo and was published in 1526. Uh, again, this he, Oviedo was kind of considered the first sociologist, the first physical geographer of America, and he traveled to America in 1514 and stayed the rest of his life. The illustration we see in the book here is a hammock which uh, maybe we don't think of or we take for granted, but it was an invention of the, of the native population of the Americas. The Europeans didn't have hammocks before they encountered the, the, the American Indians. So, Sarah, Columbus's men probably came over sleeping on the decks of the ship and went home in a hammock. Maybe so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what a contribution. Really. And then the last book in this case is? This is called A, a Brief History of the Destruction of the Indies. Now, this was written by a, a, a man named Barf Bartholomew Las Casas, who was the first ordained priest in, in the, the New World, in, in the Americas. Now, he came over uh, and really started working in 1514, uh, promoting the protection of the rights of the native populations. He was uh, not by himself, but one of the earliest voices uh, raised concerning this issue. This uh, really still a very pertinent human human rights issue. Mm -hmm. um, he did make a difference, and but it, it took many years. There was a, a whole dialogue that that occurred for for years in Spain as to the status of Indians, as should you know, should they be. Uh, converted to Christianity, uh, just a, a whole uh, spectrum of, of these issues. Uh, eventually, he did have some, some effect in, in bettering their, their position. Uh, but in, in turn, he did contribute a great deal, though, to what has been called the black legend, uh, just how, how terrible Spain was in its colonies. And this, this legend was promoted very much by other world powers wanting to, to kind of move in and, and take a part of, of the action, you know. So it, it was exploited uh, a great deal. I think we still see some of the remnants of it today. And once again, it's amazing how quickly these things happen. Right. I mean, we did not have the settlers or the Spanish coming to this part of the world until uh, 
1492, and here we are again, not 25 years down the pike, and we already have major civil rights issues. Right. And this book, by the way, or, or all of his writings, were translated into virtually every language in Europe. Wow. Very widespread. Well, to this point, we've been talking about Spanish exploits in, in the Western Hemisphere. But here we have a representation of, of one of the other major European countries racing into established colonies. This work uh, is what we call here the Codex Canadiensis. Mm -hmm. It was done by a Jesuit missionary uh, named Louis Nicholas, probably between 1675 and 1680. You can see he was an untrained artist, but still the, it just really delightful. Charming. Yes, absolutely. Right. Uh, the page we were showing right now uh, is open to the beaver, which is really representative, representative of, of some of the, the mainstays of French industry in, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, the, the furs and pelts that they were able to gather and then sell. Now, are these seals right. down here below? Mm -hmm. They're just wonderful. Wonderful. And then on, on the next page here, you can see the moose family. <laughs> I love the face. What a character. Mm -hmm. These are great. Now I can see some over here on the next page, Sarah, that look, it looks like the drawing's actually coming through the page. Right. Uh, Nicholas was working probably in an iron gall ink, which has lasted very nicely, you know, through the centuries, but is, is damaging the paper. It's gradually eating through the paper. So after this exhibit closes, uh, this book is going for conservation. Uh, probably what will be done is that they will unbind the entire book and then treat every page specifically. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now we have other things besides animals in here. Right. I think Nicholas was very interested in all aspects of, of life, of plant life, of human life uh, in, in this, this world that was new to Europeans. You know, they were so amazed. Now here you see uh, one of the, the leaders of the nation. This was probably a, an Indian along the Great Lakes region. You know, but the, the, the artifacts that he's carrying, the pipe he is smoking, you know, his, his manner of dress, you know, and indeed, is this tattooing or, or, or body paint? And we really don't know the answer to that. Really don't know. But it's documents like this that really give us a true picture of what the Europeans found when they came to this country. Mm -hmm. All right, well, this is wonderful. It, it is indeed one of the treasures of the Yale Crease collection. And this is an extremely early map just the very first part of the 16th century. Right. This was published in 1522. And again, it's, it's the basic work of Claudius Ptolemy that has been updated. All right. And here's one of the early uh, official, I guess, or, official. Uh -huh, or printed versions with, with the word America. OK, on, and here on are the these map. islands up here again. Mm -hmm. Okay, now this photo mural is made from a map that actually is in your collection. Is right. that right? We have a, this is from an atlas in, in which we do have the, the original in our collection. Mm -hmm. In fact, you can kind of see right there in the middle where the spine of the book actually came. Okay, now if we just kind of move along in time, we can see a little bit later view of the world. What's the date on this one, Sarah? This is 1573, so about 50 years later. It's changed a lot. Absolutely. Look at all the definition, particularly of North America. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how much has already been explored. Uh, it looks like they're still looking for the Northwest Passage there. Right. You know, the, the route to the Orient, to the, the, the riches, the spices of the Orient is still very important to the Europeans. And so here you see, I think, a map not only of, of the realities that they have discovered, but also of the dreams of what they want to discover. Okay. Then, of course, if we look down here at South America, at least the top portion of this seems to be rather accurate. They get chilly kind of falls shot here a little bit. How long will it be before we'll see maps where this side of, of South America becomes reasonably realistic? Within the next century, it, they're very well defined, especially in South America where you have the, the inland waterways kind of crisscrossing the country. Okay, great. Okay, now we have some drawings. Yes, yes we do. We're going to go back in time a little bit. Now, in, in looking back in time somewhat from the maps we were just looking at, uh, these are, are, again, some works done by 
Theodore Debris, who was a, a Flemish publisher, after original drawings by an Englishman, John White, and a Frenchman, Jacques Lemoyne. The, the first item we have here uh, is of a, a native man. And you see very much this, this muscular, athletic build. I think you're already seeing the beginnings of, of the concept of, of the noble savage. One thing, right. one thing to think of, though, is uh, the breed didn't have much examples of, of nudes, or many examples of nudes to work from. So he, he kind of goes back to the, the ancient Greek mm -hmm. uh, material that he might have seen. And then also the next one is of the woman and, and baby. These are probably Algonquin Indians. Um, the baby is, is really significant because Europeans had not seen babies carried on, on, a, on a mother's back before. So this was really quite a, an amazing concept and an illustration that we will see reappear for several hundred years. In fact, we'll see it later in, in another map that we have on display. One thing that's really interesting is how these early images were just used over and over again. They certainly had no problem with borrowing oh, <laughs> from things that came before. Okay, a couple of books are here next. Well, I recognize a crocodile. This must be about Florida. Right. This, again, was, was after the work of Jacques Lemoyne, who was in, in uh, some of the, the Florida area. Uh, one of, you know, an adventuresome or a, 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 you know, an adv I don't know, something that was really unique was how the natives dealt with this, this powerful, I think probably here a little exaggerated, alligator, which they do call crocodiles. Um, you can see them with the post down, down the throat and then flipping it over to, to attack it on its, its soft belly. Wow, rather ferocious thing. Right, and in, in the text it talks about how a watchman was posted in the little hut here, and then you can see again the hut here in the landscape picture, and, and there were guards waiting at all times when he sounded the alarm that these, these vicious animals were approaching. Okay, so that was just a watchtower for alligators. Right. Interesting, mm -hmm. okay, and what do we have here in this last illustration? Well. We, we chose to do this because of all the, the interest of the natives of the area. Here you have uh, them being painted to go to war with another tribe in the region. And the, the leader is holding in his hand a bowl and he's, he's working the men up. He wants to spill the blood of, of his enemies as he is spilling water from the bowl. But I think it's a it's great interest to notice the different headgear, the, you know, the different uh, just all the details. And right, once again, we have that either tattooing or body paint on the leader that we saw in an earlier illustration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it was part of the, the psychology of war, maybe. You, you have other cultures dressing for war, putting on arms or whatever. And so this is all still part of that. This is another one of the atlases in the Gilcrease collection. This is dated 1663 mm -hmm. and was done by a man named Jean Blau. Uh, it's really very good example of the Dutch golden age of cartography. Uh, it's one of a 12 volume set and we do have all 12 volumes here at the museum. Well, it's just beautiful. Now you've used this uh, map as the basis for the reproduction that we have on the wall over here. Right. And with, the, with this at a little bigger scale, we can really see the detail. It's just amazing. It's amazing how many things had already been named right. by the time the map was made. Right. You know, by this time, almost all of South America has been uh, explored, you mm -hmm. know, with the inland rivers as, as a highway coming in. And then you have along the coast, both coasts of the North American continent. Mm -hmm. I think we probably want to point out this little figure right here, too. Here's Our Lady that we saw right. uh, used about a hundred years later, uh -huh. and this time presented to us in color. Uh -huh. This is hand, it was hand colored, but again, you see the influence that, that once again, the printed word in the, the early books had on, on the age. Absolutely. Okay, now, this is our last major map in the collection. Is this the latest one as far as dates are concerned? Right. This is, again, about 100 years later. This is 1764. So this is really on the verge of the American Revolution. 
So you can again see the, the New Mexico here, the area that we later know as the Louisiana Purchase held by France. And a lot of detail, and South America is almost exactly right. right. Okay, well now we want to close with some artifacts uh, that were actually created before any of this happened. Right, so often uh, we think that American history started in 1492, but it's so important to remember that there were a variety of cultures that existed before the arrival of the Europeans. Uh, the earliest item we have on display here is from the archaic period. It's, it's a dovetail projectile point. And again, you know, a lovely work. Oh, right, a work of art in mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. But then the next item is this small bird effigy pipe. Now this was done probably about 200 AD, and it's from the Hopewell culture. Uh, this, this was a, an item that was made and never used. It was never intended to be used. It, it was a pipe that was to be buried with the owner. He was kind of taking it with him. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then a very interesting figure next to that. Right. This is a, a, a Kalima figurine that's dated between eight, 400 and 800 AD. And with this, we see a, a very an example of a very important issue in the contact between the, the Eastern and the Western worlds, and it was the transmission of disease. Uh -huh. Now, this, this Atlantic exchange worked both ways. Uh, the, the Europeans brought to the Native Americans many diseases. You have smallpox, you have measles, you have the plague, you have whooping cough, just everything, to, to a population that was a very immune, uh, or had, had no natural immunities to these diseases. Diseases. And it, uh, historians now think that between uh, 50 and 90 percent of the native population died from these epidemics. But in return, uh, the Native Americans gave the Europeans a new strain of syphilis, which is what this man probably has. Wow, those open sores are, are really obvious mm. in that. Okay, next to that we have a couple of uh, pieces of ceramics. Uh-huh. Uh, the item here with, with the hole in the bottom is a membrane pot. And this wasn't broken accidentally, but it, it was ceremonially broken uh, to, to let uh, the afterlife come through. This, was, uh, again, was a burial item. Okay, and some wonderful figurines next to that. I love the laughing child there in the lap of the of the mother. Uh -huh. These are Nayarit figurines, uh, again probably dated between 1000 and, and 1350 AD. We, do, we really don't know very much about the culture that they came from, but you have to admire uh, any people that obviously had such a sense of humor. Absolutely. And what do we have next here, Sarah? Uh, this, since we are in Oklahoma, these are, are from Spiro, Oklahoma, um, a, a very much a high point in our, our history. Uh, you have the Spiro culture having very extensive trade routes. Uh, these were items that were traded, these were shell items, and then engraved. And beautifully done. Mm -hmm. And then the last looks like writing. Right. This is a Mishtek Codex, and it is 16th century, but it was done before the arrival of, of the Europeans to, to the area where this tribe was located. Uh, again, this is, is, is a, a sign of civilization. It, it wasn't something that just occurred. Well, Sarah, it's been wonderful being here with you this morning. This is a wonderful exhibit, lots of history. Really appreciate your being here. Thank you very much. For those of you at home, we appreciate your being with us, as always, for Focus on Art.